Alrighty, let's continue with our discussion of clean flight flight controller boards by talking about the F3 boards. And I want to tell you some things that are common to the F3 boards, basically all of them, because I don't then I don't want to have to point them out on every single board. That would get really repetitive. F3 boards have more UARTs available than the F1 boards. The F1 boards had two UARTs, most of them. F3 boards usually have at least three. This tends to allow easy use of things like S bus plus smart port plus black box. Uh, you know, you have you have more UARTs to talk to more peripherals. Um, that means that in many cases you will not have to run soft serial. For example, if you wanted to run S bus plus smart port plus an OSD, you could do that on the three UARTs. You wouldn't need to activate soft serial, and you wouldn't need to take a processor hit for that. Uh, also, there are no baud rate restrictions under clean flight. Uh, soft serial is technically rated only good to go up to 57.6 kilobaud, uh, which means that some things don't update as fast as you would like or, or work as fast as you would like. With hardware UARTs on the F3 boards, there's no baud rate restrictions to hold you back. The UARTs support software configurable inversion, meaning that you do not need a hardware inverter anymore for FreeSky SBUS. Most of the time, these boards will just have an SBUS port you plug, you connect your SBUS receiver to it, your FreeSky SBUS receiver to it, and away you go. The faster processor in these boards can run higher gyro sync rates without compromising functionality like accelerometer or LED strip. So if you want to run 2 kilohertz gyro sync, that's 500 loop time maximum. If you, An F1 board can do that, but you have to disable the accelerometer, and you can't run LED strip if you wanted to. You couldn't run, uh, you know, GPS or soft serial right? An F3 board can run at the higher gyrosync rates and, and do all that other stuff in the background and have clock cycles to spare. All of the boards in this roundup have dedicated ports for serial LED strips, if that's the kind of thing you do, and for spectrum satellite receivers. They all have that. I don't know that every single F3 board in the world has that, but all the ones in the roundup do. And most of these have an onboard barometer as well, but I don't think you really care about the barometer. I don't care about it, and I'm not going to mention it again. So, um, what's not good about these boards? Many of these boards still use I2C to talk to the gyro, which means that they're limited to 2 kilohertz gyro sync, even though the processor could run at faster gyro sync rates. Uh, is this really a bad thing? Betaflight goes up to 2 kilohertz right now, and there's a, a project out there called Race Flight, It'll go up to 8 kilohertz. But these are still very cutting edge features. And 1 kilohertz gyro sync, which even an F1 board can do, is still very, very good flight performance. So if you're the kind of person who insists on squeezing the absolute most out of your board, then you probably want to go run race flight and run 8 kilohertz gyro sync. But for most people, the fact that a board uses I2C versus SPI is more a marketing point and a future-proofing point than it is a practical uh, flight advantage today. Okay, so that's my opinion on that. But I will tell you which ones use I2C and which ones use SPI at the end of this video. Uh, the USB port on these boards does not run through a UART. The way the F1 boards work is that the USB port is connected to a serial-to-USB converter basically on the inside of the board. It uses up one of the UARTs on the board, which is why the F1 boards only have two UARTs and the F3 boards have three. And what that means is that your computer sees the board as just a comm device, a serial device. Whereas with the F3 boards, the computer usually sees the board as a virtual USB comm port instead of a like a legit for real serial comm device. And what that means is that on some Windows systems with some boards, there are issues like when you reset the board, the virtual COM port goes away and you have to unplug and replug the board to get it to come back, as opposed to just resetting the board and boom, you can, you're right back up and running. Not every device has these problems and not every mach machine has these problems, but sometimes they happen and it's, it's annoying in some cases. Uh, okay. So let's move past that. I think we've said everything we need to say here. Let's let's look at the boards. The first one I want to point out is the SP Racing F3. It stands out. It was, I believe it was the first, if not the first, certainly one of the first F3 boards to hit the market. Certainly one of the biggest ones to be widely distributed. 
Um, yeah, I'm sure there was a, I'm sure there was a CC3D with an F3 chip. There must have been because CC3D has always been ahead of the curve on that one. But, um, but this one was very widely marketed and was, I think, uh, hit the point where F3 boards really took market acceptance from F1 boards. Uh, the good thing about the S SP Racing F3 is that it directly supports Hydra, who's the main clean flight developer. He, de he designed these boards, he sells them and he gets money when you buy them. And that's good. We should all give money to Hydra. He does a lot of work, and we all like Clean Flight. Clean Flight is awesome. He works uh, f to, to develop it for us. He deserves our money. If you don't want to buy this board for any reason, you should still go give him some money using this donate button in the Clean Flight configurator. Okay, go give him five bucks right now. Give give me five bucks while you're at it. As well, no, give him five bucks first. Give him five bucks. Give him ten bucks. Don't give me any money. Give him ten bucks. Uh, he deserves it. It has 64 meg data flash on board and all the other things we talked about on the previous page. See, I'm not going to talk about them again. What's bad about this board? Uh, the main thing about this board that might be bad is that some people have reported the boards failing at an unusually high rate or unusually quickly. Like I bought the board two weeks later, it failed. No reason why I didn't really even crash it. It's hard to assess whether this is a trend or whether it's just you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? The, the, the people who have failures talk about the failures. People who don't have failures, they don't have anything to say. Uh, the board layout is slightly questionable in that the decoupling capacitors are placed. I've been told, I haven't verified this by looking at the, the design, but I've been told that the decoupling capacitors have been placed further from the components that they're supposed to protect than would really be ideal. And that could result in a premature failure. So, I don't know whether this is legit or not, but it is certainly a thing that is said about this board that I'm now repeating. So take that for what it's worth. It does have an I2C gyro, which means it can only run up to about two kilohertz. The other thing about this board that's a little uh, different is that, like if you look here, UART 1 is through hole, UART 2 is micro JST, UART 3 is through hole. The, uh, the RC pins, are uh micro jst it's all just a little it's all just a little haphazard and like it, it would annoy me to have one of my serial devices be through hole and one of my serial devices be jst that would just annoy me so i don't know you decide okay let's keep going seriously dodo seriously dodo f3 has a built-in voltage regulator that's good Accepts 2 to 6S input, 5 volts at 500 milliamp output. Has automatic VBAT monitoring from the onboard regulator. So you just feed your battery voltage into this thing, and it automatically monitors the battery voltage in clean flight. No need <clears throat> for a separate wire running to a VBAT pin. It has 16 meg data flash on board. Bad I2C gyro, max about 2 kilohertz gyro sync. Eh, maybe not so bad. Until V3, the board backfed the ESCs from the USB port, which bugs me and kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth, but it's been fixed, so you don't need to worry about that. Here's a picture of the board. It does have a, a single row RC header. Here's your motor headers, LED output and buzzer. Here's your spectrum satellite output. It has an RSSI input. That's nice. The Moto Tornado. Uh, the Moto Tornado, uh, it has does not have a built-in voltage regulator, but it does have a piggyback header for the Pololu voltage regulator that you will buy from Pololu and install. And that's kind of nice because if you want a 500 milliamp voltage regulator, you could get that. If you want a, a larger, you know, one amp voltage regulator, you could get that. And it's always nice that if your voltage regulator dies, you could replace it theoretically. So, so this is, you could see this as a plus or a minus, depending on whether you, you, you know, you want the integration of the built-in one or whether you like the idea that you can piggyback one on there. But I put it in the good column because let's just be nice. Has automatic VBAT monitoring when onboard voltage regulator is used. Oh, by the way, the other nice thing about this is if you already have a voltage regulator, like your PDB comes with one, don't just don't install the Pololu and just feed it five volts like normal. That's not really an option with some of these other boards. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it is. But either way, with these other boards, you've got a voltage regulator you don't need if you don't need it. Whereas with this one, if you don't need the voltage regulator, just don't put it on. So that's nice. 
the tornado supports a high current buzzer on either 5 or 12 volts. Other boards, as far as I'm aware, all the other boards in this roundup only have 5 volt support for 5 volt buzzers, which means they're not as loud as they could be. A high current 12 volt buzzer is going to be much louder than a 5 volt buzzer, which means that when you've lost your copter in the, in the tall grass and you want to find it, it, you'll be able to hear it from much further away. The motor tornado has buffered 5 volt motor outputs. What that means is that the motor outputs are amplified. That's a good way of putting it. A buffer is an amplifier. This gives additional stability if you have something that's like very noisy ESCs like the little bees, which are reported to make a lot of noise. Uh, and it also means that if you were to elect not to run ground wires to your ESCs and just run the signal wire, you would be more likely to get away with that with these buffered outputs. Um, but on the flip side, they're unidirectional buffers, and that means that BL Heli pass through, where you can you can configure your ESCs from BL Heli suite without unplugging them from the board, just leave them plugged in the board. That doesn't work on this board, and it never will. It's not a software thing; it's a hardware thing, and and you 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 could desolder the buffers, I suppose. You could you could do that, and you could replace them with resistors, perhaps. But but basically, uh, but no, no, BL Heli pass through not going to work on this board. Uh, there's overcurrent protection on the motor outputs, so if there's a short, it's not going to burn out your board. And finally, and I know this is subjective, but whatever, it's my video. In my opinion, the Tornado is, is one of the better board design and layouts of the F3 boards on the markets. For example, if we look over here, uh, just everything is placed sort of neatly, intelligently, and conveniently. Uh, and I feel like it's really well designed. It does have JST headers for the UARTs, but at least it's consistent. Unlike the SP Racing F3, where one of the UARTs has one, one doesn't, you know, it's a little weird. Um, so, and, and also, if you look at a pinout design here for the, uh, for the input headers, it's not labeled here, but it's very clever how it's been laid out, like, like in terms of, you know, where the pins are. If you're going to do CPPM, you plug in here. If you're going to do SBUS, you plug in there. Just made very efficient and intelligent use of the space. It's very clean layout. Uh, so... I, I'm I'm partial to this board. Unfortunately, the fact that this board doesn't do uh doesn't do BL Heli pass through is just a total deal breaker for me. Um because I that's just a feature I use all the time and I wouldn't buy a board that didn't have it. So as much as I like this board, uh I wouldn't buy it. Also it doesn't have onboard data flash, which is not a big deal for me because I like open log, but I know a lot of people like data flash. So that that'll be a deal breaker for some people. It doesn't have it. Okay. Okay. The Luminaire Lux has a built-in voltage regulator, accepts 2 to 6S input, outputs 5 volts at 1 amp. Nice. That's a lot. That's a lot of amps. It has automatic VBAT monitoring from the onboard regulator. It was designed from the start to support up to 8 kilohertz gyro sync, which means it has an SPI gyro, uh, which means that it can read from the gyro at the full rate once the software supports it has a very clever and good pad layout. They've placed the motor headers at the corners of the board, so you don't need to run all your motors over to one side of the board. Very clever, very smart. They're not the only ones to do this, but it's pretty rare. There are reinforced solder pads, so you can see it's designed for either edge launch pins, if you want pins, which that's going to be a deal breaker for some people because some people don't like edge launch, or you can just solder directly to the board, and I think that's more like what it's probably been designed for. And they've got reinforced solder pads so that if you have to desolder something, it's not going to destroy the board. Has a built-in filter for inputting FreeSky PWM RSSI, so you can you can output the RSSI from your uh, D4R2 directly into the board. And it has a pre-installed button to jump the bootloader pads. How many times have you been fiddling around with one hand holding a paper clip on the bootloader pads uh, and the other hand trying to plug in the USB to flash your board with the bootloader? There's just a button. Oh, hallelujah. Like, how, why did it take so long for this to happen? Thank you, Luminaire. Okay. What's bad about it? No onboard data flash. The Luminaire guys said, look, just use open log. Data flash fills up so fast and it takes forever to read. It, just like the NAS32 Rev6, it uses the 6500 gyro, not the 6000 gyro, which has worse noise performance than the 6050. But at least these guys used SPI, right? TimeCop used the worst gyro and didn't even use, use the one thing about it that's good. But at least these guys used SPI, so fine. Um, 
it just started shipping. In fact, just today, people were saying that they got theirs in the mail. So it's still an untested product. And for all we know, thousands of them will hit the street and then they'll start dropping out of the sky because they have a flaw. So we can't rule that out. Lumineer is a solid vendor. It's unlikely. But I got to say, you know, many of these other boards, people have been flying them for a while and we kind of know the ins and outs like that. Maybe possibly there's a problem with the SP Racing F3. But this one, we don't know. Okay. All right. Luminaire Lux. The Moto Cyclone. This is a board also is not, it's not even shipping yet. Moto has talked about it on RC groups, has showed pictures of it. They're still doing their internal testing and we don't know when it's going to hit the street. But it has many of the good features of the Tornado, piggyback header for a Palolo voltage regulator, VBAT monitoring, high current buzzer. The motor outputs still have overcurrent protection, but instead of buffers, they've put serial resistors in. They is Moto basically. Uh, what that means is that BL Heli pass through works. You don't have the five volt buffers, so in noisy environments, you may still get some issues, perhaps. It's pretty rare. I think if you run your ground wire in addition to your signal wire, that usually you don't have an issue. So in theory, there are some edge cases where the buffers on the tornado would do a better job, but m most flight control boards don't have buffers, and most of the time that's not a problem. So I don't think this is a really deal, uh, really a deal breaker. I'm putting it in the good column. And it's been designed from the start for 8 kilohertz gyro sync, which means that it's using SPI to read from the gyro, and it's using the MPU 6000 chip, which is better noise rating than the 6500. Yay! This, was, this is the right thing to do for best performance. SPI chip with a better noise rating. Good. Bad? No, no onboard data flash. I can't think of another bad thing to say about this board, except also for the fact that it's currently completely hypothetical until people actually get it in the air. Here's a picture of the board, very similar to the Tornado. Not a lot more to say. Here are some other ones that are worth mentioning. There's the Code Layer Singularity, which is an F3 board with a built-in video transmitter. Now, I almost left this out because I feel like if this is a feature that you want, you're not really going to be comparison shopping against the other boards. You're going to get it for the video transmitter and the rest of it, you know, as long as it's not terrible, just leave it alone. Uh, but but I put it in. It's got a built-in 5-volt regulator, only accepts up to 4S input, not 6S like some of the others. And it has 128 meg of data flash. That's a lot. That's the most of, I think there's one other board in here that has 128 meg. That's a lot. Bad. It has a built-in video transmitter. Well, isn't that good? Well, yeah, it's good, but also it's bad because it means if you break your video transmitter, you got to replace your flight controller. And if you break your flight controller, you got to replace your video transmitter. And the dang thing is 100 bucks, So it's not like you're not going to feel it. It's not like you could get a Moto Tornado for around uh, 30 bucks, and you could get a, a TS, sorry, typo there, TS5823 video transmitter for about 12 bucks. And, uh, you know, you could just buy both of those again for the price of one of these boards. So I think if you, you, you're going to buy this if you have money to burn and you just don't care, or you're going to buy it if you really need a well-integrated uh, setup and you need to make the most of your space. Also, if we look at the pin layout, they've had to really squeeze these pins all over the place to try and make them fit uh, with the video transmitter on the board. And they've been some smart about it. Look what they did with the motor layouts. Motor 3, motor 1, motor 2, motor 4. They put them at the edges, at the corners. So that's good. That's smart. And, and that's going to make a neat a neat install. But then we've got this 3-pin header here. Presumably that maybe that's Spectrum Satellite. I don't know. We've got some pins over here. We've got some pins over here. We've got some pins over here. They're just sort of all over the place. It's kind of going to be a, a mess when it's installed. So it's too bad that something that's designed for a neat and clean install is going to kind of make a mess out of your wiring. But, eh, there you go. And then this is the last one, uh, the, the X-Racer F303. The X-Racer F303 is, it's a very, very compelling board. Uh, it is a cheap board out of China, but it doesn't appear to be just a ripoff of anybody else. So nobody's, nobody's getting their proper intellectual property ripped off or stolen from them. It also, like the Luminaire Lux, has a pre-installed micro button for the bootloader. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone do this. It has 128 meg data flash. That's the most that I've seen. It is cheap at $27. It's one of the least expensive F3 boards available. But dang it, it gives the Nase32 Rev6 uh, a run for its money, and that's an F1 board. Look what they did with the, the UART headers. One, two, three, four. 
one, two, three, four, TX, RX, five volt ground. So one right by the other. It does my heart good to see a nice, clean, and neat, and organized layout like this. I like it a lot. Uh, it has the full three row header for RC input. That's either a plus or a minus, like I talked about in the previous video on the Dragonfly. It does take up more room, and it, but it also gives you the opportunity to plug in your peripherals very simply with a with a five volt and ground for each one as needed. And you don't have to install the third, the, the second and third row of pins if you don't want to, but you can. Uh, it does have an I2C gyro, so it will not run at eight kilohertz. It'll only go up to about two kilohertz. And here's the kicker. This would be my favorite board in this whole roundup. I would I would unequivocally uh, recommend this one, except it doesn't have VBAT input. You can't do battery monitoring and logging. Now, here's the thing. I use an OSD, so I have VBAT monitoring on my OSD. But I also use Blackbox, and I sometimes want to look and see what my battery voltage was doing. That's why I have Blackbox, because I want that information. Now you can go and you can solder, you see these tiny little pins here? You can solder a tiny, tiny wire to one of these tiny, tiny pins and hook a voltage divider up to it and you can have VBAT monitoring. It's there, it's just not broken out on the board. And if you are very good at soldering, you could do that without destroying your board, but most of us will destroy our board when we try to do that. So hey, X-Racer, put a VBAT pin on here and this will be the perfect board. Seriously, but until it has VBAT monitoring, I just don't know. I just don't know if I would pick one of the other boards. Okay, a couple more wor uh, words on technical stuff. Why does the MCU choice matter? Here are the three MCUs uh, used in, uh, rather, these are the, the gyro and accelerometer chips. They're the MCU 6050, 6500, and 6000. Notice that the 6050, which is what most of these boards use, has an I2C interface, which means it maxes out at 2 kilohertz. The 6500 and the 6000 have an SPI interface, which means they can go up to 8 kilohertz. But look, the 6500 has a noise rating of 0.10 degrees per second, and the 6000 and the 6050 have a noise rating of half that, 0.05 degrees per second. Now, what does that noise rating mean? If, if you had the chip and it was perfectly stationary, it should read out 0 degrees per second on all axes. The random background noise in the chip would cause it to read out up to these numbers on average. Actually, this is an average, so it could read out peaks of more than that. So basically, this is creating phantom noise, and your, your, your PID loop will potentially try and compensate for that noise, which doesn't exist. Okay, so you don't want that. So lower is better. Um... So the 6500 is used on the NAS32 Rev6, which doesn't even use SPI. Why? Just use the 6050. Okay, fine, whatever. I'm sure Time Cop had a good reason, right? He always makes good decisions, right? Okay, fine. Uh, and then the, uh, the Lux uses the 6500 as well, but at least they take advantage of the SPI. Whereas uh, the Cyclone is the one that comes to mind that uses the 6000. And I will take a look at my table coming up. I think that's the only one. Um, does any of that matter for flight performance? Well, Moto thinks it matters because he put the 6000 on his Cyclone board because of its lower noise rating. But then Lumineer put the 6500 on the Lux, and so they clearly don't think it's a big deal. So I don't know, but there you go. Now you can, you can think about it. Lastly, here is a cool table that summarizes all this information. And it also has the price of the boards on it, which certainly factors in. Now I've cheated a little bit. For the SP Racing F3, I've put the price at $65 because that's how much it'll cost if you buy one from Hydra. And Hydra does so much for us that if you buy one of these, you should buy it from Hydra and spend $65 on it. Think of it as paying $40 bucks for the, the board and an extra $25 bucks to buy Hydra food and rent and beer and whatever he buys. Okay, I know and you know that you could go on Banggood and get an SP Racing F3 clone for like less than that. But I'm not going to say any more about that because I feel it's a little disrespectful to Hydra, who, who does a lot of work for us. Okay, enough said. You might then ask yourself, well, why am I talking about NACE32 clones? And if, if I want to be respectful to Hydra, why not Time Cop? And I'm not going to say any more about that either. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's the sum up here. Uh, notice for BL Heli Pass Through, on the SP Racing, I've got maybe, and that's because I've heard some reports from people who say that they, using an SP Racing F3, cannot consistently get BL Heli to detect their ESCs. 
but in theory it supports it but some people in the field say that they it doesn't work for them consistently and for the singularity in the x-racer f303 i say probably supports it i don't know anybody who's tested it and verified it but there's no reason like with the moto tornado where it has the buffers to think that it wouldn't work okay all righty so now you have all the information you need to make your own decision i hope that's been helpful and happy 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 shopping <laughs> happy flying bye bye